Welcome to the latest edition of CMS Connected. Hi, everybody. I'm Butch Stearns of the Pulse Network. And I'm Scott Lee with Digital Clarity Group. Good to see you again, Scott. Good to see you too, sir. Happy holidays. Thank you very much. You too. How's everything going? Things are going really well. It's been a long uh, stint on the road, lots of travel, but I'm looking forward to the holiday season and being home for a little bit, so yeah. Me too, and I'm looking forward to this edition of CMS Connected because we are talking about modern enterprise portals. Why are we talking about this today? Why the renewed interest in yeah. portals? Wasn't this a decade ago? It, it, it was a decade ago, and there is a resurgence of interest in portals, and I think rightly so, because you know the, the idea that portals um, essentially can bring lots of disparate data and insight and information together uh, into a single place. And we talk so much, Butch, on this show about people wanting to talk about busting down silos. Well, here's a way silos serve a purpose. Information is good to be kept in, in, in different places, but how can you pull that information together uh, in context for the right person at the right time, all of this? And portals start to play a role in that. So we're building silos back up today? No, we are harvesting <laughs> appropriately from each. Oh, you're a farmer today. That's what we're going to do? You see my overalls, right? <laughs> All right, here's what we have coming up in the show for you, talking about modern enterprise portals on this edition of CMS Connected. We're going to be joined in studio by Michael Hahn from LifeRay, and at the same time, to talk about that subject, Tim Walters from Digital Clarity Group is going to be Skyping in at the same time. In our Spotlight segment, we're going to look at Marketo and Sonny Lenarduzzi of Falcon Software. We'll be reviewing them. And also Jill Finger Gibson from Digital Clarity Group will be joining us to talk about a recent acquisition that's making some big news. But before we move on further, let me take a moment to thank our lead sponsors here on CMS Connected, Falcon Software. The people at Falcon Software can provide you with expert advice and integration solutions for all your creative web design, web content management, and e-commerce, social, or mobile needs. And Digital Clarity Group, DCG, of course, a research and advisory firm focused on navigating organizations through the digital transformation process. I'd also like to take a moment to recommend that right down below us you download the video white paper that's there for you delivering cross-channel digital experiences at scale and that white paper has been supplied to us by the good folks at eSpirit and again it is located right at the bottom of your screen. All right, Scott, are you ready to get started with our headline segment? Yes, indeed I am. All right, let's start with news item number one and this one there's a lot of buzz around the fact that Ektron and EpiServer were both acquired, yeah. uh, AKKR, private equity firm in the middle of all this now. In full disclosure, you are an advisor to Ektron, EpiServer, and AKKR. Yes. So as far as the implications of this news, I think we have the right person in studio here. I know a little bit about what's going on. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So let's talk about what's going on. Uh, after denying to TechCrunch that Ektron had been sold, yeah. Tim McKinnon admitted in a later phone conversation to Ron Miller uh, that a sale had happened after a document confirming the deal had been mm -hmm. circulating. The merger will result in AKKR stockholders and other funds affiliated with Excel KKR owning 100% of Ektron through the buyer. It, it's a full-blown sale here, right? It, it, it is a sale. I mean, I think that's not the news. That's the news that the, that the likes of the kind of TMZ wannabe journalists in the industry wanted to get some headlines. And it was good waves for a weekend. It was a lot of fun, poking fun at, you know, how frankly poor uh, Ektron is at managing the story and managing the information that gets out there. Ultimately, the new owner of, of Ektron is Excel KKR. It is a private equity firm that focuses on technology. They have a good reputation in that front. They also own, by the way, North Plains. Um, so they, were, they had made an investment in Ektron a number of months ago. I think it was back in April. Um, Ektron hit some numbers for them, and essentially they were able to uh, make, make the purchase and wanted to move forward with that. So why was Ektron sold? Was this a good buy? So um, yes, two questions. I'll answer both. So why was Ektron sold? Ektron basically needs cash to, f to fuel the business model that they've taken on now. I think um, essentially they are a company that you could literally have bought the, the, the product you know, for $5,000 on a credit card less than 10 years ago. Uh, and they've got a really large customer base, 4,000 customers primarily in the U.S. And essentially they've had a, you know, through, you know, they've been, uh, the founder, uh, Bill, 
uh, what's Bill's last name? Sorry. <laughs> anyway, Bill Rogers, sorry. Um, Bill's the founder of the, and has been helping the company, and basically he has allowed, there's just a lot of customers on a lot of versions of that product. And so as the product has matured and has grown all the way, by the way, in, in the price tag, um, essentially haven't necessarily been everybody to, to bring them all along. And so the cloud starts to become, and a SaaS subscription model starts to become the answer for that, which I think is a good answer because it lowers the barrier to entry for some of these folks to be able to stay on a good product and work with them and be able to not have to lay out so much cash up front for the new version of the product. Um, also, by the way, subscription customers are worth about 10 times that of the value of an on-premise customer over the lifetime. So it's a really good business model to shift. However, if you think about the SaaS model and the subscription model in general, is it requires an awful lot of cash because you pay as the vendor all the fees for customer acquisition up front, whereas the customer only pays over time, month over month, year over year, and so you don't get recoup that cash for a long time. And so as you, you know, basically, so the point is having the backing of a big private equity firm like this to be able to get you through that, look at the boxes, look at Acquias. They all have big backing because they have to have deep pockets to take on a strategy. So like a little this. more on, you mentioned their 4,000 customers, a little more on what the sale of Ektron means for their 4,000 customers. Yeah, so of those 4,000 customers, only about half of them are actually on support today, right? Um, but I think what it means for them is they do have an opportunity to be able to stay on a good quality product um, and shift into the cloud, which will essentially help them help themselves, which is to stay on the latest and greatest version of a product, which is always a challenge for companies, um, and to be able to essentially bring their bring their technology into the into the latest, you know, into the 21st century, essentially. So I think it's good for them, for those who want to make the leap. There certainly are going to be those who want to go take this opportunity to evaluate other options, and that they, you know they might be right to do so. But I think it, you know the new product, new version of Ektron is a good option for many. All right. So for more analysis on this, let's look at the EpiServer yeah. side of it. EpiServer, uh, a CMS vendor from Europe. Yep. So the significance of EpiServer involved totally in different this. story. Um, Excel KKR looked at EpiServer, who was owned by another private equity firm that they had sold to. I think it was in 2010, 2011 who had taken the majority stake and owned them. That private equity firm, IK Investments, was actually based over in Europe and had no other technology companies and products in their portfolio, very little expertise in this space, and frankly, didn't do much to move the needle. I mean, it allowed them to make a number of acquisitions like Media Chase and e-commerce platform, a number of things like that, but really, what EpiServer has been trying to do is establish a presence in the US, which it really hasn't been able to do. For four years or so now, they've been trying to migrate and get a foothold in the US to to take on you know, significant competitors like that of Sitecore and even Inectron, um, and as they are a .NET, .NET CMS. And so they haven't really been able to establish that foothold and their, reach their potential in the US while they are a fairly uh, popular product in Europe. Um, and so I think Excel KKR, for very different reasons than they took on Ektron, saw EpiServer as being exactly on the right track, uh, on the, on the, on the right track with their product, just that they could exploit their advantages of them knowing how to run technology companies and the, the uh, relationships that they can create for them to help them essentially get and establish that much stronger foothold in the U.S. All right, one final point, again, as an advisor yeah. to Ektron and EpiServer, who both were acquired, and an advisor to the private equity firm Excel KKR yeah. that did this, give us the inside scoop. Give us something people don't know. Yeah. And one final point about this acquisition that really you know, it was going to resonate sure. in the market. Sure, I'll, I'll tell you this, which is that there is a lot of speculation out there about, oh geez, Excel KKR goes and buys both companies, is the plan to go pull them together. The piece that you may not necessarily know is that both of these were very worthwhile uh, investments individually, and, and at the time that they made the um, investments in both of them, they were looking at them completely individually. Um, at this point, you know whether or not they'll look at pulling the two together, which is the big question on the street today, um, is certainly something that, that they'll look at, and certainly something, by the way, that if you look at the history of Excel KKR, they've done before. They've pulled multiple companies within their portfolio together, um, but that was not the plan out of the gate, and I think Think that'll be looked at and you know who knows um, but we'll watch that closely and let you know when something happens for our next news item here on this edition of CMS connected we're going to talk about an acquisition progress software swooping in to purchase Telerec this was announced on December 2nd that progress software had completed the acquisition of Telerec Telerec is a provider of tools and technologies to address the entire application development life cycle through this acquisition progress will now provide comprehensive cloud and on-premise platform offerings. And joining us, Skyping in all the way from Bulgaria on this edition of CMS Connected, is VP of Product Strategy for Telerec. He's Martin Kirov. Martin, how are you? 
Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Just uh, wrapping up some final things before the holidays and looking forward to some quality time off. Well, we're glad to have you here with us. This is exciting news for your company. Tell us about it. Well, very much so. Uh, Progress, uh, they have a great team, a lot of like-minded people, a lot of positive energy. We've had a number of opportunities to meet with their teams, both in Sofia as well as in Miami at their global sales kickoff uh, last week. So we're really looking forward to, to working together in 2015 and beyond. Well, let's talk about what progress will expand upon to keep the initiative moving forward. There have been quite a few positive changes happening within Sitefinity in North America in the past two years, such as larger employee infrastructure, deeper resources allocated to the product line. What will progress expand upon to keep this moving forward? You're right, we've had uh, a few very successful years. Uh, we, we were able to keep this high growth momentum and a uh, big part of this acquisition was inspired by growth. So the uh, progress is looking at Telerik uh, to, to, to some extent uh, to, to fuel the growth of the joint company and Sitefinity plays a big part in that. Uh, we're the second largest and fastest growing product line of Telerik and as such, uh, progress are looking to really enable us to keep that momentum going in, in 2015 and 2016 and beyond. Uh, some of the things that uh, we've already discussed and that we're planning to do uh, early next year include leveraging each other's products uh, in some areas where they're really complementary. For example, they have a very mature offering in their data uh, connectivity business, and we're looking to leverage that for the digital experience cloud that we're launching in March as well as Sitefinity to provide more data connectivity out of the box. Uh, they also have a really exciting business rules engine uh, product called Corticon, and we're looking to leverage that technology within Sitefinity to manage uh, business rules, um, compliance, and uh, workflows. So these are some, some, some of the things on the technology level, and we're also expanding our sales and marketing teams as well as our marketing programs budgets to make sure that we're closer to our customers and more visible on the market. Martin, let's talk about the conversations you're having with your customers or your clients right now. Again, exciting news for you and your company, but when customers hear about this, they get excited also. <laughs> what conversations are you having with your clients about the longevity and the direction of the platform now? Well, uh, to be honest, some of our clients were concerned. Uh, some had prior experience with progress, so they were not as concerned. But, uh, I mean, looking at what happens in the industry, we cannot really blame uh, the concerned customer because they have invested a lot in this. I mean, these are all strategic projects, and they're concerned about the future of Sitefinity within the new combined company. Some of them were afraid that we would get uh, progressized, as, as one customer put it, but none of this is going to happen. So we are maintaining our entire team. Uh, we're expanding it further. So all of our processes and operations remain the same, but we are now getting uh, the funding and resources of a larger and very profitable organization. This is a growth story, and we're following our vision uh, that we've outlined and communicated to our customers, but we now have the resources to really execute faster. This is the only difference. And of course, uh, talk is cheap. So at this point, talk is all we have, but we've told everyone to really look at us delivering on our plans, our roadmaps, and our commitments. I think at that point, everybody will calm down. You know, interesting to hear you say that, Martin, because communication with your customers obviously is so key. Just doing it in the first place, but how you do it also. Have you found this enjoyable? Has it been challenging to communicate with your customers about this? We, we communicate with our customers all the time, including myself directly. So what we did is a number of uh, press release campaigns, multiple blogs from the leadership, and most importantly, personal emails sent from myself and some of the other leaders to all of our customers. And they got the chance to respond directly, so I was engaged in over a dozen of these conversations. And they brought up different things, some related to the acquisitions, others less so, so they use this as a forum to, to, to have a conversation with us. But uh, we think that in, in, in situations like that, we really have to over-communicate. We understand that for now this is only words, but it's important to Great. reiterate this message time and time again. Great. All right, Martin, let's finish up by looking ahead. Uh, what are the top initiatives of this acquisition of your company, Teleric, by Progress Software? What are the top initiatives that are going to come out of this uh, in 2015? 
there's there's multiple discussions happening across the different products and divisions within the web content management space. Uh, we're really looking to leverage the data connectivity technology of Progress to provide out of the box connectors for the digital experience cloud that will be launched in uh, in March of next year, as well as for Sitefinity. And we're also looking to leverage some of their other technologies within our product. And uh, the other thing is really the expansion of our sales and marketing operation. This is this is very key for our continued growth and for us to be able to be closer to customers and assisting them directly. And finally, we're looking to leverage some of the partnerships that they have to enter in the, the market in Japan and APAC. Martin Kirov, the VP of Product Strategy for Telerik uh, in Bulgaria. Martin, thanks for uh, Skyping in and sharing this exciting news with us for your company being acquired by Progress Software. And happy holidays, my friend. Thank you. Happy holidays. For our next headline story on this edition of CMS Connected, we talk about another acquisition of another digital agency, but this is not just another acquisition. Publicis acquiring Sapient for $3.7 billion in cash. <laughs> we need someone to make sense of this, and therefore we turn to Jill Finger Gibson, uh, principal analyst here at Digital Clarity Group. Jill, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are good you? Good to have you here. Thanks. So, Thank so make sense of this for us. $3.7 billion? Yeah, so um, it's a pretty large amount. I think it, it, it caught some people by surprise because um, not too long ago, the chairman of Publicis, Maurice Levy, said that he had $4 billion set aside for acquisitions. And it turns out he blew $3.7 billion of it on, um, on acquiring Sapient. So it's a bigger deal than just another, another agency acquisition, for sure. So why, why, why Sapient, then? What are the, kind of, what are the big headlines about this about this acquisition in terms of why Sapient, why he would go out and basically spend almost all of what he stated as his cash for this on Sapient. What, right. what does Sapient bring to Publicis? Well, Sapient, I mean, one of the things that I think all of the agency groups have been very openly saying is that they need to become more, um, more uh, suited to dealing with technology and technology world. And Sapient is known as it's probably one of the last remaining independent agencies. They also have significant technology practice, and that was that's in their DNA. And they also have a large offshore delivery center in India, um, which uh, adds significantly, I think, to its value in 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 Publicis terms. Interesting. So. So is the idea then to leverage that offshore? I mean, that's a fair amount of their even employee base. It's 13,000 employees in, yep. in Sapient, like 8,500 of them are offshore, yep. right? So, so what's the plan for that? Is it, I mean, and, and, and how will that work? Is, I know that that was a big part of the acquisition, I think, and the big part of the talk was leveraging that kind of India offshore base. What's your thoughts on that and um, what's the prospect I think, for I think maybe they can't be too um, clear about underestimating how much work that is going to be because mm -hmm. The culture, you know, we've seen the the whole one of the the, the areas of friction with with agencies and systems integrators is that there's one the technology culture which is very different from the sort of more creative design strategy culture and so how those two are going to be brought together and be leveraged over the other agencies within the publicist network um, still remains to be seen I think. Interesting okay yeah because I, I mean you know we hear stories as well about I don't know that systems integrators or technology development companies even have that model perfected right, right. I mean there's right. plenty of, of friction and challenge there and kind of waste to, you know they talk about it's cheaper, but it's more time necessarily and man hours and all of that. So right. I, I can see that might be a challenge. Um, what, what's, an, what's another thing? Tell me about the kind of just the idea of shared services generally, that this would be a shared services for multiple agencies. Talk about that um, within a holding company that's trying to now work together more than we've seen before. Yeah, so I, um, I kind of view that with a degree of skepticism because in reality what we've seen is um, this whole agency holding company model um, the agencies within even the same holding company very rarely work together, and they often sometimes they bid against each other um, within within um, different bids for projects. So, mm -hmm. um, how they're going to come together and use the shared services center, it's it still remains to be seen because also with, even within these agencies, although they're similar, you know, they work on digital and technology, they have their own culture. You know, Rosetta Razorfish has its own culture from 
Digitas, which has its own, uh, you know, the, all the different yeah, agencies. It's, sure. it's different different cultures coming together that way as well. So to think that suddenly we're going to have Kumbaya and I'll be able to work similarly. <laughs> we gave an analogy in a blog post that we wrote about the, the, the idea of artists on a label. That's that right. They might have been acquired by the same label, um, but they're still individualists. They, they work the way they're going to work. They have their different audiences. They, you know, might be looking for the same sorts of gigs and any work together that they might have is merely a result of a relationship relationship between them specifically, not because they happen to be on the same label, yeah? Exactly. Um, yeah. So one other comment that I have, and I wonder if you can comment on it, is I think an interesting point in all this too is it seems that um, both um, Levy and, and, and Alan Herricks, who's the, uh, Maurice Levy, who's the, mm -hmm. the CEO of, of Publicis Group, and uh, Alan Herrick, the, the CEO of Sapient, have really been talking up, it seems to me, about the consulting side of this, that right. Sapient Global Services and Sapient Government, whatever they have, they have a couple of consulting divisions, um, a la Accenture Consulting, that sort of thing. Right. Um, you know, it seems to me that we've seen a fair amount of um, consulting firms more recently, I think even Accenture and a few others have made acquisitions of agency types. Mm -hmm. um, now it looks like the agencies are trying to get into the consulting business mm -hmm. and, and they're bringing these two things together. I think that's an interesting theme there. And especially as we talk a lot about customer experience management being more than just kind of this marketing function, which is typically where the agencies play, and more about a kind of business process and organizational change, much more right. holistic view of that. And now if we're in consulting, um, I, I wonder if that's, you know, it's an interesting point. Any, th any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think so. And I, th I think probably the whole issue, you know, we do see this coming together of the Accentures on the one side who, who made their name, their main business is in business process and helping companies work better. And then these agency uh, networks that are coming up that are trying to get into consulting. And I think th there's also probably an underestimation of the level of skills and the types of skills and the types of experience you need to get into those types of projects. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's going to be interesting to see how, as these different different um, types of companies come together and start competing, maybe have head to, to, head to excuse me head to head. Mm -hmm. um, we start seeing okay, well, what does it mean for an agency technology firm to get into business process consulting? Sure. I, I'm I'm still not sh not sure about how Sapient's going to um, demonstrate that they can they can take okay. that on. Jill, how about a final thought about competition? WPP and Omnicon. I mean, the news to them. How was this news received to them when Publicis acquired Sapient for three point seven billion dollars? Well, I think I think there were some rather sort of personal and snide comments made by those chairmen. <laughs> uh, wasn't it Sir Martin yeah. Sorrell, who's yeah. the chairman of WPP? You know, uh, I can't remember the exact comment. Do you remember what he said? I don't remember the exact comment, but it was definitely snide, and yeah. there was a, a fair amount of back and forth nipping about 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 that. Yeah, yeah. which which kind of I think distracts from the whole. You know, these companies, the, it's it's not these. Although they have an important role, these chairmen, they are not the company. Right, so I think the reality is is how are the cultures underneath them uh, going to come together and and to be able to compete? You know, I think I think WPP and, and Omnicom are gonna, you know, they're gonna get a run for their money probably by by this acquisition um, if it's integrated properly and if, if it's a success. Okay, thanks, Jill. Time now for our final headline story on this edition of CMS Connected. We go to CMS Wire and a story about chaos, Scott, raining down on CMS. Vendors. This year we've seen a ton of change at the executive level of multiple content management vendors, according to Lawrence Hart, contributing author at CMS Wire. Um, and he writes in this article that people are starting to panic and that the cloud has introduced severe disruption mm -hmm. into the market. Let me start with the notion of change at the executive level. This isn't news. We've been had change at the executive level since the dawn of time, haven't we? That, that that's basically right. We're one of the most, I feel like, incestuous industries in this space. That everyone has played a role at so many different places because you get you gain some expertise and you you know you want to move up in the path. And so the only place to go do that is a competitor. Okay. Yet the title of this chaos yeah. rains down on the industry. You sort of agree with the premise of that. Why, with all these executives changing? Yeah, I think it's valid, the point that you make, the, the nod to you on the disruption point, that there is a fair amount of disruption that's going on in this space. Um, and the point that Lawrence makes here is kind of the, the rationale that he's come up with for this, is the, the entry of some of the new business models. The SaaS business model, which is not necessarily so new, but um, it, is, it, it is definitely uh, pushing the kind of 
enterprise content management vendors in a direction that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise wanted to go, but I think disruption in the space and, 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 and innovation is a really good thing. But the likes of Dropbox and Box being on the heels of these folks enforcing what we call uh, in the space is the enterprise file sync and share, so EFSS market, is really pushing the um, ECM vendors to kind of question their business models, having to offer new capabilities to essentially be able to fend off the, the attacks by the likes of the boxes and the drop boxes in the space there. All right, that is our headline segment on this edition of CMS Connected. Time now for us to take a quick break. When we come back, we dive into our topic, modern enterprise portals, and we will be joined by Michael Hahn from LifeRay and Tim Walters from Digital Clarity Group. You are watching CMS Connected. So you've got a great website. Your marketing team spends hours driving visitors to it and nurturing them into leads. And your sales team spends hours collecting, qualifying, organizing, and chasing those leads. Sales wants to focus on what they do best selling, and marketing wants to get on with what they do best, creating innovative campaigns. But how do you make both teams happy? The solution is marketing automation. So you've got a great website with hundreds, maybe even thousands of visitors. That's great, but each one has their own background, interests, motivations and goals. But you are showing them all the same content. Not very clever. The solution is content personalization, allowing you to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time in the right form. So let's see how content personalization works. In this day and age, it is more important than ever to get the right information in front of the right people at the right time, especially at the enterprise level. So that's one of the main reasons that today on CMS Connected, we're talking about modern enterprise portals. And this subject is so deep and so big that we need two experts, and I'm not talking about Scott here. So we bring in Michael Hahn, <laughs> Director of Operations uh, VP of Operations for Lifer. Michael, thanks for coming in. Oh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, let's talk about your role at Liferay and what you do and why this subject is so important to you. Yeah, absolutely. So my role at Liferay essentially is to ensure our customers are successful in their solutions that are delivering, whether it's a customer portal, whether it's to help their partners collaborate better, to reduce the cost of servicing their customers or they're supporting their customers. Great. Uh, let's bring in our other expert for this segment. He is the co-founder and principal analyst at Digital Clarity group, Tim Walters. Tim, how are you, my friend? Doing fine, Butch. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, great to have you here, Tim. Tim, let me start with the, the softball question, if you will, or maybe it's not. Why is there still a lot of confusion about this term and the technology when we're talking about portals and modern enterprise yeah. portals? What are we talking about here? Yeah, it's been it's been kind of a question around portals since the very beginning. Um, and, and it actually caused not just confusion, but a lot of um, you know, unsatisfactory implementations in the early days. And that's because, um, first of all, there's confusion about what you, what you mean by a portal as a type of website. So it's what you're building. It's what you're trying to produce and, and, and present to your, your visitors or your customers. And usually a portal is just, just means that it's something that either aggregates information from other sites and repositories or, and or points to other sites and repositories. So it's a portal, it's a gateway in the literal sense. And then there's portal servers, the technology, the software technology that you might use to build a portal. And in the early days and kind of the first generation from say roughly 2000 through 2006, seven, a lot of people were confused or they, they made the leap from thinking that what they were building was a portal to, um, being certain that what they needed to build that portal with was a portal server. And that's not always the case. And matter of fact, there are many, many cases in which either you're confused about what you're building, it's not really a portal, it's just a kind of sophisticated website, or what you are building is a portal, but you don't necessarily need a portal server to build it. And so a lot of people overbought uh, or simply bought the wrong thing. And it, it led to, and those early portals were often heavy, uh, complicated things to operate, took a lot of development. And it led to a, a lot of unsatisfactory outcomes in the early days. Hey, Tim, so just a quick follow-up on that, though. I mean, I would imagine that uh, 
analysts still seem to be just as confused. I'm not sure how customers yeah. should be expected not to be confused when the likes of Gartner just pr produced this horizontal yeah. Uh, yeah, portal this is my favorite. MQ. <laughs> Tell me, I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so uh, you know, in the analyst community um, around 2009, 2010, I mean, we, we were having discussions that maybe the portal server um, would disappear as a as a meaningful software category. I mean, did it did it make sense anymore? And this was because of the emergence of things like widgets and mashup technologies that were capable of doing many of the same things as portlet technologies based upon the JSR standards. And and in a certain way, I would argue that in fact it has disappeared as a meaningful software category. And the best piece of evidence for that is precisely the most recent um, Gartner uh, Magic Quadrant on what they call horizontal portals. Because if you look at that document, it contains, or the, the graphic, it contains, you know, what are traditional kind of portal servers, uh, IBM WebSphere, Oracle Web Center, and, you know, the, the, the kind of open source uh, light, lighter weight um, uh, tools like LifeRay, Drupal, arguably a portal, but more of a web content management system. But then it includes Adobe Experience Manager, it includes Sitecore, and my favorite, it includes Salesforce.com. Now, when you're putting all of those things together in a bucket and writing horizontal portal on the side of it, horizontal portal doesn't mean anything anymore. Interesting. So let me bring Michael back into this a little bit. Michael, so tell us, you know, we were thinking about them, you know, and even as Tim talked about, there's been a number of kind of reinvigorations of life essentially <laughs> for portals and it seemed like they were going to kind of die off into irrelevance for a while. They were talking about the death of portals, but there's this resurgence now. Tell us. I think to Tim's point is that you know a lot of people are confused about what is a portal, right? And I think the analysts that made the call of, hey, this is the death knell of portals, they were actually really very much correct about the first generation, right? First generation portals, if you really look at them from the vendors like WebLogic or BEA at the time, mm -hmm. uh, WebSphere, et cetera, they were very much you know just tools to help sell application servers. There's a tremendous cost to actually implement and actually roll out a solution. Yeah. But now if we actually look at today's portals, and you know, if you look at the Magic Quadrant, there's a, a, a lot of different tools out there, whether it's content management, whether it's portals. But I think the one thing you will find is that a lot of these tools incorporate uh, web content management, social collaboration, and of course the fundamental foundations of a portal, which is the ability for you to easily integrate data from your enterprise systems or even third-party data sources, right? If you're in financials, for example, going out to Yodli or one of those other uh, aggregators. Yeah, gotcha. So, Tim, what about you? Similar, similar question there. I mean, what, what, what do you think is? By the way, I think interesting point that that Michael makes there about uh, it was a subtle one, but I want I want to harp on it a little bit that portals became kind of the ways for vendors to es essentially sell application servers. I think that's an interesting point, and I heard you kind of chuckle about that. But what are some of your thoughts about kind of just the resurgence in general? Yeah, I, I think the the resurgence is because you know the world is getting more and more complicated, uh, and with the uh, you know whatever you want to call it, the uh, the era of the customer or empowered consumers and and digital disruptions and so forth, and I think the best way to think about this in terms of the of portals and portal technologies like like LifeRay. Uh, is in terms of Jeffrey Moore's distinction between, or not distinction, but discussion of systems of record and systems of engagement. And systems of record are those things that are, you know, quote unquote, infrastructural elements um, such as ER ERP and uh, and databases inside the um, inside the enterprise. And those things, um, you know, can, you know, kind of laid the groundwork for the modern enterprise, but they don't do a good job at all of interacting in a dynamic and interesting and engaging way with consumers. That's what systems of engagement are for. And in order to power systems of engagement, however, you have to tie them into those systems of record. You have to make all of that information available, often very, very quickly in you know, microseconds for a satisfactory customer experience. And portal servers are the perfect technology because they're, in one sense, they're middleware. And in another sense, they're the UI layer. They're the user experience layer uh, on top of, of all of this in terms of personalization, customization, dynamic elements, and so forth. And so if you realize the challenge now is to create really powerful and superior systems of engagement by drawing onto and integrating with your systems of record a portal server is a natural technology to use for that. So I wonder what both of you think, and um, whoever wants to jump in here, maybe I'll, um, Michael, have, have you start with this, and then Tim, we can get your thoughts on this. I actually just did an advisory day yesterday with a digital agency, and we were talking about 
holistic CEM and, and customer experience management and the idea that it's more than just tailored relevant experiences you know, that marketers try to do as another way to kind of personalize experiences for, for customers and prospects, but rather that, Tim, as you've written about an awful lot, that holistic CEM is really about, it's an entire organizational uh, challenge and it's how we essentially, mm -hmm. the customer experience as it goes beyond just the buying process or the review process and really into how can we leverage insights when a customer is calling into support? How can they know what they've just done on the web? How can that be transferred over into in, for the sales folks to be able to right. make sense of this? And the question that was posed to me was, well then, you know, we need to have a system, don't we? What's going to be the big system that's going to house all this data? And it's a similar question to one posed when I was on an analyst panel at Gilbane recently where they said kind of what's going to be the new big giant system of record then? Is it like the content management system or is it a new CRM mm -hmm. system? Where's going to all this stuff going to live and shouldn't we be feeding some big massive system? To me, that seems to be going back to the mistakes of ERP and I wonder if portals can play a role here in being able to kind of build these bridges amongst where these various systems of record could have an awful lot of data to be able to bring the right information to the right person at the right time. What do you think about that? I absolutely agree. Because, I mean, if you look at the ERP days, right, and, you know, there's a lot of companies still implementing ERPs, but mm -hmm. these are multi-million dollar, multi-year projects. And, you know, if we take any lessons learned from the Agile movement, the Agile software methodology, it's you want to deliver fast, you want to deliver frequently, and you want to make sure that you get feedback from your business stakeholders and so on. Mm -hmm. And this is where portals come in because you know portals are designed for, for modularity, which basically means that you would develop a certain module, whether it's to encourage or support people to log on and, and see what customers are actually doing, what do they buy, how are they interacting with your sales channels. Mm -hmm. And then you roll out another module to facilitate your marketing team, see what customers are actually doing, what are they browsing for this, through the site and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's very much about keeping things small and delivering value immediately to the business in iterations. Sure, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I know, Tim, that you talk a lot about kind of a lean approach as well. I mean, I'm envisioning, and tell me your thoughts on this, I'm envisioning literally a support person using their support tools comes up on the screen and they're seeing all the past calls that this particular customer has made, but why not also show the activities they just had on the website, which would have been coming from some, you know, uh, WCM system or analytics system. Why can't they also see the service records for this, you know, right. all in one place, and that's how I'm thinking about it. What were your thoughts there, and also about what Michael said? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, maybe there's a terminological nicety here because we we talk about a, a system of record, and typically that means, you know, as you said, the one that's going to own everything, uh, and that's that's probably not a satisfactory path to take anymore. It's more about letting the stuff live where it lives and integrating, you know, concentrating on the integration. In other, in other words, the portal server can be the kind of system in the sense not of a repository where you suck up all this stuff and, and harbor it as the system of record, but a system in the sense of the dynamic connections between the various elements in the call center, on the website, in the marketing automation platform, in your uh, customer databases and in your ERP systems and your production databases that brings all of this together to create that system of engagement for I, for both employees, as in the scenario you just described, and of course for the prospects and customers that you're engaging with on the front side. Tim Walters of Digital Clarity Group joining us on this edition of CMS Connected as we're talking about modern enterprise portals alongside is Michael Hahn of LifeRay, Scott Lieber, co-host of CMS Connected. I'm Butch Stearns of the Pulse Network. So Scott, let's go right back to the beginning of all of this and the importance of portals. So are they more important than ever now? Is there renewed life? Is that why this wave is where it is? I think there is definitely renewed life. And again, I think the distinction about portal servers versus the idea of pulling information together, there is definitely a thirst for the latter, um, which is driving in many cases a thirst for the former. But the thirst for the latter is, again, we've got all of these silos of data and rather than this idea of busting those down, which many want to call for, which is frankly silly, it's more about how do you harvest information from each and where and when and, and, and when you need it. And I think that's the role that the technology can start to play. So Michael, I'm curious what you hear from your customers and your clients, the ones that are out there, what's keeping them up at night and how portals are helping them address some of those issues. Absolutely, so I mean, you know, back 10 years ago, I was with a company called Broadvision, which you know, very much was recognized as a leader in this space. Sure. But then you know, a lot of customers had a hard time implementing the costs were very high and so on. Mm -hmm. When I talk to my customers today, it's very much the same message. 
you know, it's about, well, I want to make it much simpler for me to go and talk to my customers, to talk to my employees and my partners. So what can I do to do that? And this is where you know, we look at the portal world as, hey, let's not just talk about integrating this backend data. How do we bring about the content into the picture? How do we bring about social collaboration tools into the picture? Mm -hmm. So now we can have crowdsourcing. So we can have customers helping each other, partners helping each other. And this way help overall reduce that cost of engagement, cost of implementation. Tim, your thoughts about those conversations that Michael's having with his customers? Yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And there's no doubt that, that that's the kind of conversations or the kinds of um, desires that we hear from, from companies as well and from service providers and agencies who are, who are trying to implement these kinds of technologies and, and come up with the appropriate solutions. I think, uh, on the other hand, if I'm looking forward a little bit, you know, at the same time that people have a desire for simplicity, the things are getting more and more complicated. I mean, already, you know, we're, we're supposed to be into the age of customer experience management. And yet, if you're lucky, some of the leading companies are doing kind of digital marketing. They're not really approaching omni-channel customer experience management yet. So imagine how hard that's going to be. And then within, you know, a few years, uh, the Internet of Things is going to be um, in full swing. And now that experience that you're trying to, to create and manage for your customers has to include not only all of the individual touch points between you, between your brand and that customer, but also all of these connected things and all of the relationships between them. And it just gets more and more complicated, although from the visit from the customer perspective, it has to be simpler and simpler. It has to be more and more transparent. So I think the technology challenge or the or the software and integration challenge is going to get ever greater and that's where portal server technologies if that's what we could what we continue to call them are, are going to become more and more important as we go forward I, I, I agree with you Michael so tell me your thoughts on this obviously as a stakeholder <laughs> in, in in the future of portal technology what is the kind of the the, the broader port, life race specifically and the broader portal market in general going to look like in the next three to five years well if there's anything in the marketplace the constant thing is change Right? And we're very excited about the speed at which technology is changing. So if we look at, you know, even in the mobile device realm, you know, phones are, I don't want to say yesterday, but now what we're really looking towards is how do we now incorporate more attached devices like your wearables, things on your smartwatch, things like mm -hmm. that. How do we bring that, leverage that in the enterprise so that mm -hmm. we can bring information to people on the move mm -hmm. much more smoothly, much more quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're investing very heavily in terms of turning the portal, not just into something that presents user interfaces, but think about it as a presentation of data, a headless portal. Gotcha. Right? And certainly along the, 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 with the impact of the massive amounts of data we gather, right? you know, it, user interactions flow through the website and things like that, big data and data mining are, are huge investments for us, sure. right? digging into those areas. So yeah. let's wrap up this conversation with a comment from all three of you. I mean, it seems to me, Tim, let me start with you, that you know, we started this whole conversation talking about the portals were the buzz 10 years ago. Well, let's look into the crystal ball 10 years ahead. So you did such a good job explaining it off the top, but 10 years from now, are we still going to be as confused about portals and portal servers <laughs> going forward? Yeah, I certainly hope not. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say, but I, you know, I think that maybe, uh, I guess I'll, I'll take the stand and say that I hope we're not talking about portals and portal servers in 10 years. Um, and, I, and already today, I would say, um, you know, as, I, as I noted, when you've got a, a document like the, the Magic Quadrant for, for that mix of software companies and the products that they produce, um, it, it doesn't make any sense to call all of those portals. And it doesn't matter whether you do. What matters is, what is the appropriate technology for the job you're trying to get done? Uh, and if you want to call that a portal, if the thing that is being offered is called a portal server, fine. If it's a, if it's a widget and mashup um, platform, fine. If it's a user experience platform, if it's a customer experience management platform, even if it's salesforce.com, if it gets the job done, which as we've all agreed is really um, increasingly about integration uh, from you know various repositories and even the Internet of Things. I mean, Intando, one of the Italian kind of minor portal players, is now converting, tr transforming itself into kind of a user interface for the Internet of Things, and that makes perfect sense. That that is a technology that's appropriate for doing that. Um, but I think that's that's the question going forward: is is what what do you need in order to get the job done, and and less so about what you're going to call it. Yeah, I, th 
I, I, I think that um, the only thing that we know about 10 years from now is that we'll be 10 years older. I think I mean, the accelerating <laughs> pace of change is just ridiculous. If we think that it was only, uh, what was it, seven and a half years ago that the iPhone yep. was introduced and what has happened since then. Uh, but we'll still turn the same question to you, Michael, and, and have you answer the same question as Tim did, is kind of what's this look you like? Know, coming from a vendor that sells a por enterprise portal product, you know, certainly we s hope that we are still talking about that in 10 <laughs> years. Uh, but really, from, from our standpoint, it's not about the technology stack. It's not about, am I on Java, am I on a portal server? Mm -hmm. It's really about the solutions we're going to create, right? And I think fundamentally, in 10 years, we're still going to be talking about these solutions because they are very much appropriate for the business problems we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And as data continues to grow, this is going to be more and more of a problem. Yep. Well, Michael, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming Great. in studio. Thank Michael you, Hahn it. from LifeRay. And Tim, as always, Tim Walters from Digital Clarity Group. Thanks for your time. Yeah, my pleasure, Butch. All right, time now for our Spotlight segment on this edition of CMS Connected. And in the Spotlight today, we're going to be reviewing Marketo. And to do that, we bring in Sonny Lenarduzzi from Falcon Software. Sonny, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Great to see you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you, too. I wore red to be festive today. <laughs> awesome. Great to have you here. So let's talk about Marketo. Founded in 2007, they provide marketing software and solutions designed to help marketers master the art of science and digital marketing. They're in San Mateo, California. But they also have offices in Europe, Australia, and Japan. Uh, they serve as a strategic marketing partner to more than 3,500 large enterprises and fast-growing small companies across a wide variety of industries and a thriving network of more than 400 third-party solutions and over 50,000 marketers. So uh, explain more about Marketo and what you like about them. Sure. Well, you kind of did a great job there, but <laughs> it's a great lead-in for them. Uh, obviously, marketing automation software is what Marketo is, um, but the differentiators for me about Marketo are really in the details uh, and in the offerings that they have. So it covers everything that you would expect it to cover, uh, email marketing, social engagement, landing pages, um, and also provides extremely advanced analytics, which is a huge benefit to marketers because they can see uh, the real value and uh, the revenue generated from their market marketing efforts. Um, the focus is on lead generation, customer retention, relationship management, uh, and obviously inbound marketing, marketing solutions as well. Marketo's platform standard features for marketers, you touched on it, but what are they? Um, well, one of, I mean, for me, the standout feature would be uh, the real-time personalization. Um, and what it does is it really takes IT out of the equation, um, which is a growing trend that we've seen in the last year, last couple of years. Um, and I think something that marketers are are kind of happy about, uh, makes everything a little more streamlined. So the challenge is obviously uh, marketers are investing time and money um, into inbound, inbound and outbound uh, campaigns like social, PPC, SEO, uh, and email, and creating all of this content that takes a lot of time, like I said, but it's going to people who are anonymous um, and makes it really difficult to quantify and to um, generate revenue. So uh, what Marketo offers is real-time personalization so you can present the right content to the right people in real time. Um, so Marketo has the ability to tailor on-site visits to anonymous visitors based on two out of four relevant criteria. So it's industry, digital behavior, customer profile, and location. Um, and thanks to the analytics that I mentioned before, you can also see which organizations came to your site, what they searched for, which pages they looked at, and uh, also their digital body language as well. So lots of very intuitive data that is hugely beneficial in generating revenue, generating leads, and uh, locking down sales. So Sonny, let's talk about social media. You've touched on it several times, but for marketers, of course, it's vital now. And in what you just said, getting the right information in the right hands of the right people at the right time, of course, social media gives you those opportunities and those challenges to present that. So when it comes to Marketo and social media integration, what do you like about what they do? I mean, they do, they've hit the nail on the head so many times with social media, and I think it's something that 
it's been a big challenge for marketers to sell social um, to their bosses, to the CEOs of the company as something that actually generates revenue because it's not um, that easily quantifiable. But what, what Marketo has done has made it much more easy to see the correlation between um, social engagement and um, sales revenue. So one of the integrations is uh, the Hootsuite Marketo uh, integration, and it allows marketers to connect their social interactions from their Hootsuite dashboard um, to their Marketo lead database. So it allows users to generate qualified leads directly through social, uh, qualify the leads faster with social scoring, which is a hugely beneficial um, tool uh, that you get deeper insight into buyers through lead data and social insights. Uh, there's metrics uh, that you can measure that will really give you um, some great data into who exactly you're dealing with on social and why they're valuable to the company. And that's information that you can present to the sales team. Um, and you can see how the activity is driving the conversions and revenue. So what social has done is it puts the power of buying into the buyer's hands. So people are going online and they're fi finding real reviews from their friends and family. And ultimately, that more than anything now is driving um, sales. That's, that's helping people make decisions on what they're going to buy, whether it's a big purchase or a small purchase. So now it's up to marketers to figure out how to leverage that into sales and also how to quantify it. And that's really what Marketo is able to do. Sonny Marketo's top competitors? I mean, the number one competitor is obviously HubSpot, um, but in looking into it further, um, HubSpot is more aimed at small businesses um, who are getting started with inbound marketing solutions, and uh, it's easier for companies to grow into um, HubSpot, and the entry level is uh, much more affordable than what Marketo is. Um, so Marketo is definitely aimed at larger clients, uh, enterprise level, um, and there isn't a ton of room for growth for small businesses uh, to ramp up their inbound marketing um, offerings. Um, and obviously, it's, like I said, a little more pricey. But um, even though HubSpot may be a little easier to use, and that's something that people have said in comparing the two, I think that comes at the cost of customization, um, which is much more in depth when it comes to using Marketo. And Sonny, finally, what's the biggest pro, what's the biggest advantage of Marketo to you? Um, I think it's it, like I said at the at the beginning. It's it's an all in one offering. It's really all you need. Um, and as a marketer, it takes other aspects out of the equation. It allows you to do everything yourself, um, and it's extremely easy to use. There's the drag and drop interface to create landing pages quickly, easily, um, and get campaigns out in real in basically real time. Which nowadays in marketing let's face it, that's number one. Um, and to be able to react to things like social and the needs of your customer and, and customer sentiment online. Um, it's intuitive um, with the real-time personalization, the click rate analytics, so you can see when customers are clicking links, uh, lots of important data there. Smart list technology is highly targeted. Um, and also there's the remarketing options. So people who maybe have visited your website in the last week, you can remarket to those people using Marketo. Um, and also one of my favorite aspects of it is that if you have a really successful campaign, there's the cloning feature um, to basically duplicate that campaign and, like I said before, get it out there quickly before maybe your competitors do something similar. All right, let's bring Scott Lee. in here on this edition of CMS Connected in our Spotlight segment as we review Marketo. Uh, what stands out to you in Sonny's review of Marketo? I think was, uh, that, was a, that was a great review, Sonny. I think, that was, I think it was excellent. I think the points that I'll make then are less about the product and more about I think the company. The interesting thing to me about Marketo is that it is one of the few uh, kind of s marketing automation platforms that are left standing after this kind of big run took, took place, on this big run, acquisition run on, on marketing automation platforms over the course of the past two years or so, um, where Eloqua was snagged up by Oracle and um, you know, a number of Salesforce made two acquisitions in this space. So there was a big run on, on, on this as everybody wanted to get into the space and Marketo stands alone. Not only did they stand alone, and I think they certainly were courted, and there was a lot of speculation about them being acquired, but not only did they stand alone, they actually doubled down on that by, by going IPO. Um, and their stock is up and they're looking pretty good and healthy. In fact, they've, they've gone even further than that by uh, making an acquisition of Insightera, which provides the capability that uh, Sunny noted as one of kind of her favorite features in terms of the real-time personalization there. So um, tends to be a platform more oriented towards B2B, I think. Um, but I really, I think it's interesting that they still stand alone and that um, 
they are growing as a platform itself, not a bolt-on to another platform, but rather as kind of the, the destination where marketers were already coming, um, and now they're going to kind of add on to that to, to add more capabilities and bolster that even further. So Sonny Scott paints a picture that the future couldn't be more bright for Marketo in that they're a standalone. You say that it's an all-in-one platform. Do you agree? I absolutely agree, and I actually think that their positioning and how they've um, they've marketed themselves uh, as kind of an aspirational um, product to use is a great way to go because that does leave them as being the cream of the crop and where marketers want to head to. So, absolutely, I think the future is very bright. Hey, I, I made a comment quickly. Just one last question, Sunny. I made a comment about the 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 B two B focus. Certainly, that was like Inside Terra's B two B. That was their focus. Do you have a Do you have a sense for B two B versus B two C for these guys? Are they more oriented in your mind, one way or the other? I would say definitely more so B two B over B two C. I think that also lends itself to the fact that they're looking more so at. Um, at bigger businesses, and that's why I think the cost is more to, to deal with Marketo as opposed to going to a HubSpot. I look at a, at a hub sta, HubSpot, sorry, I look at a hus, HubSpot as more of a B2C offer, offering for sure. Gotcha, great. And the, and the only thing I'd say to your comment, Butch, is the future does look bright. It looks bright purple for Marketo. I'm <laughs> not a big fan of the purple. You know, it's just like purple everything. <laughs> purple, purple, purple. I'm kind of, you know, anyway. Why not orange? What colors are DCG? HubSpot's got. It's orange, but that's HubSpot, I guess, took it. So, and they're like orange to the nth degree as well there. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> These marketers and their colors. Sonny Lenarduzzi from Falcon Software in this edition of our Spotlight segment on CMS Connected. Sonny, thanks for being a part of the show once again. Uh, happy holidays, my friend. Same to you. Thank you. Bye, Sonny. All right, time now for a new segment here on CMS Connected. We call it CMS Insider. Too bad we didn't have an insider to do. Oh, oh he's sitting right here. <laughs> nice, nice. You nice. are our CMS Insider. In all seriousness, Scott, you take pride in that term because you love this stuff, don't you? I do love it. I guess, uh, you know, I... I'm an insider because you just labeled me an insider. Uh, but no, I, I mean, in, in truth, I do love this. I was just saying to Butch that I've been home two business days in the last four months. I travel constantly, um, and merely it's because I, I really love my job. I love what I do, and I love being able to, on one day, um, sit and run an advisory day with a digital marketing, di sorry, a digital agency about what their strategy looks like. On the next day, doing the same thing with a vendor who's trying to figure out where their product should be going in the next over the next three years. And literally the day after that, sitting sitting with a client uh, on a buy side who's trying to make sense of this space and, and understand what are the products and what are the agencies that they might want to work with. And I think this is the perfect time to give you and Digital Clarity Group a couple pats on the back. Well deserved. It's the end of the year. Yeah. Two Two awards that are worth noting, well, several awards for you. The IIAR, the Institute of Industry Analyst Relations, has voted Digital Clarity Group as the new analyst group of the year. Congrats. Yeah, thanks. You know, I didn't actually even know this. So IAR, IIAR is an extremely respected organization that's for in analyst relations professionals and has been around forever. Um, they do this, they give out this award every year. Um, and I didn't even know we were up for it at all. Uh, they're a nonprofit group completely. They uh, the key people who led the research for this, I didn't even know their names. I, I certainly didn't talk to them, but they 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 really, you know, conducted a nice study, and we were really honored to be to yeah, be labeled as the Yeah, and it's great to receive awards. And again, congratulations! Thanks. But for viewers of this segment and this program, it matters to them because it qualifies. TCG at a different level, doesn't it? You know what? It really does. And I think the second award that you mentioned from Influencer Relations was also Analyst Firm of the Year, where we were given awards. On a, they they run it across ten categories, and in we were made eight of we made the top ten out of seventy firms for eight of those categories. Top five for four of them. I, I think this is what it does for you, folks. Have. DCG is a new, along with others, Constellation Group, uh, HFS Research, is a new breed of analysts from around, kind of take a different approach than the subscription model of the, of the, uh, uh, of the legacy firms, where um, we all take our own different, different business model to the approach. But the point is, is that we, we connect with users in a way that I think others, maybe the legacy firms, don't have the ability to. We can be nimble, we can be agile, we can cover topics that might be hard to cover. We don't have to worry about categories and keeping up with publications of things that have been you know, done since the dawn of day and that subscribers are expecting. So we can kind of chart our own course. And I think the really nice thing about an award like this is that folks can really like our process and our way of working and our people and relate to us, but ultimately you use an industry analyst as a bit of a CYA, uh, you know, cover 
your butt, let's say, when you're making big business decisions. I mean, analysts are about helping you make decisions and shortlist for big acquisition, big buys of technology. And so that's what you get by being able to point to the likes of a Gartner or a Forrester. And I think what this really does for us is we can appeal in terms of our process and our differentiation in our way, but it gives us a little bit of the CYA that you can be comfortable that in one of the cases, 1,100 other people have said and voted us as a, as a top five firm to be able to work with. So, so I really like that, that aspect of it. When you really spell humbling. but, you start it with an A? Is that, um, is that absolutely, the yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our CMS Insider segment for this edition of CMS Connected. Uh, Scott, you were recently at the J-Boy Conference, the annual conference in Denmark in the first week in November. Yeah. So let's look closer at that conference and give us some insider info about it. First of all, it's a unique conference. What makes it so unique? You know, I really like this conference. First of all, you know, J-Boy and DCG have partnered on a number of, a number of things. And, and I really like this conference because the uniqueness of it is, frankly, that it's in Aarhus, Denmark. Who's heard of that, by the way? It takes planes, trains, and automobiles to get there. Um, really, and that's frankly why over the, for the past 10 years I've been invited but haven't made it out there until this year. Uh, I've only made it to the event in Philadelphia, but this is their main event and I gotta say that it was so worthwhile. It does take two days of travel, but um, they even talked to the folks there about, you know, should we, should we change location? And the answer was a resounding no. That when it's, it's worthwhile, that when people get there, they forget everything else, they forget their office jobs, they network with people that they you know, really value their opinions and that they find like-minded associations with. Um, they, they learn good insider stuff. You, you talk about this as being an insider segment, and I think the folks that come and make it to the J-Boy conference, whether they're on the buy side, the sell side, they're an analyst, they're an industry um, talking head, they, they really do have a, a, a dedication to this field. Uh, and and dedication to this craft. So you always really hear great. about conferences and how the networking is great, but this one really is. I mean, Giannis Boy, who's run this conference and found the J Boy, is um, takes networking to another whole level. It's really obvious. I mean, to the point that there are so many. It is. He does talk about it that it really is about the networking as well. So whether it's the lunches or the dinners that you go to and that are really a part of the agenda, almost you are having a conversation for ten minutes with somebody. And literally, you get a tap on the shoulder. Sorry, sorry to bother you. I'd like you to meet so and so. I need it. I got. And he's literally walking around and orchestrating, bringing one person to the next the whole time. This is what they're doing. Wow. So it really is focused on connections, and I think people value that as much as the great content that you get. All right. So this is CMS Insider. So a conversation you had at the conference that sticks out. Something that you left there with. What's something that you can offer? to our audience? You know, um, what I really value about it is that I get to talk to, I mean, and have intimate conversations with, you know, we think that we're serving an audience of people who are reading our posts and are responding to us in, in some comments every once in a while or retweeting, and so you think that you're on the right track, but to really be able to sit and talk to people who are leading this process for their organization and hear their feedback about, you know what? This is all great in theory, but, or you know, here's how it's really working for me. There's a lot of users that were there um, presenting from, from, from various businesses. A guy from Lego made a great presentation about the way, that they've, the way that they've adopted their technology and taken it to the next level. And oftentimes what you get from them is you get these insights um, about the pragmatic ways people have had to take this on that may differ from the route that you might even be trying to send them as an analyst um, because they've got to get their job done, they've got to achieve the metrics they've been asked to, they've got to hit the goals, um, and, they, and they do what it takes there. So, so it's, it's really interesting. versus theoretical. Really theoretical. pragmatic. There's right. some theory and there's some pragmatic, but I, I think it's really, yeah, it's, it's really great for that. All right, that is our CMS Insider segment, and that's all the time we have for this edition of CMS Connected. So I'd like to thank our guests who were on this show. Martin Kiroff from Telerik, Jill Finger Gibson from Digital Clarity Group, and Michael Hahn from LifeRay, and also Tim Walters from Digital Clarity Group, and of course, Sonny Lenarduzzi from Falcon Software. Uh, our next show, Scott Leeward, we're going to be here January 22nd. We're going to be talking about interpreting the 2014 WCM Gartner Magic Quadrant, always a much debated subject and topic. That'll be a fun topic. Allow us to get into maybe a little bit of a criticism of the quadrant itself for, from them and their, their ratings of it and a little bit of commentary on each one of the vendors from me. Yeah. All right, and fun. on our way out, I'd like to thank our sponsors once again, Falcon Software and Digital Clarity Group. So, for CMS Connected, get connected. And stay connected. On CMS Connected. We'll see you next time.